so it just gives you a broad idea of um, what I'll talk about. Um, why and what we're doing, then a large part around administrative microdata. Um, Carl and Hannah uh, made references to the importance of having data and integrating data. And that will then flow into compiling accounts. Um, in terms of purposes, um, the whole area of environment is so broad that there are many different purposes. Um, whether it's kind of whether your views on nature and the well-being of nature or the well-being of people, and then the, the causes of any change. Um, and then looking ahead, you have sustainable development goals and well-being. You also have government policies. The idea of an environment tax or an environment subsidy to influence behaviour. And then climate change and uh, planning ahead, how we plan ahead that kind of gets us to where we want to go. They're just examples. Carl had a much more extensive and pretty list. Um, in terms of within the CSO, the European Statistical Office would be our primary kind of master, so to speak. And from the central framework, they developed a regulation which obliges us to do certain modules on an annual basis. Um, then there are some other modules that haven't moved onto a legal basis that we compile on a voluntary, annual, biennial type of basis. Everybody, every member state talks about a lack of resources, so that is why they don't all move on to a, into a regulation. In terms of the regulation, it came in two waves. So, we had three modules that kind of we did first and everybody reported on annually. And then a second wave came a few years later. So Ireland has submitted data for all six of these modules to Eurostat. And we have published um, an annual release for four of them. The other two, the, well for three of them, the second wave we're still bringing the data up to a quality where we publish it at home. So while we have provided data to Eurostat, we want to do a little bit more work before we publish at home. On the voluntary modules, the subsidies and transfers, we publish that on an annual basis. The forest accounts, they comprise around seven different tables. So we've completed part of them and other parts we've <coughs> to do at some stage. The water, that's also six or seven tables, beginning with the amount of rainfall in the whole country. Met Aaron would help us there to kind of extrapolate out from different rainfall stations to get the total rainfall that kind of fell in Ireland. Then you have what comes in and out between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And then what happens to that kind of in terms of um, supply to domestic or non-domestic and then the wastewater at the far end of it. Um, so again, that's something we're trying to develop, but we have more work to do. And yours that um, they get a different response rate because it's voluntary. So some countries complete part of it. Land cover and land use, we have done some work in it in one year, and the Ordnance Survey, EPA, National Parks, they have done a lot of work in that area, and we're beginning to work with them. Um, that's an example of one of the statistical releases that would be up on our website. Um, you can see within it, um, there are monetary valuations, and you have a breakdown like wastewater, biodiversity. Within the release, then, you have each individual subsidy. So whether it's um, the hen harrier scheme or whatever, you can see a very detailed breakdown. Um, there are two other releases, the material flow accounts 
and uh, environment taxes. And the release is kind of a good discipline. It also makes the data quickly available to people who want to do research. And then they can contact us if they need something more detailed. Um, so apart from environmental accounts, we also have um, basic statistics. So within the CSO, in an economic framework, you have national accounts, but then you have a whole lot of business surveys. So this would be the equivalent of the business or social type surveys. And they cover, you know, the whole area is huge. You know, even though we have very few people compared with national accounts or business, the scope of the whole area is very big. So waste, energy, forestry, fishery, and there'll be many more that you could add on to that. And these will, the data from this area will feed into compiling accounts. So we need to have this on a good footing before we can compile comprehensive accounts that you can develop a time series from. In, sometimes you can get a one-off study and you can publish an estimate. But to produce another estimate to put beside it and then another one, then the time series, are you getting the up and down correct? So you need much higher quality data and more data if you want to publish on a time series level. Um, in terms of the approach, um, you know, Carl mentioned the Netherlands. I thought maybe that could have been a, a much darker green or something. Yeah, probably. They're, and then the UK are doing a lot of work as well, um, and you know, a lot of the Central American countries are doing a lot of work in Australia. We've been a little bit shy in terms of the environment division um, Hannah mentioned was set up in 2015, so we're still kind of finding our feet. So what we're doing is trying to get our hands on data and make the data onto a, an integrated basis that we can use more readily. Um, rather than kind of jumping into compiling ecosystem accounts immediately, we're trying to get the basis behind it into, into good shape. Um, Carl is going to solve the measurement challenges. <laughs> and Stephen. <laughs> um, there are a lot of pressures on the environment, so we're going to, I think the area will become a more important, um, but at the moment it's still really economic and macroeconomic and social statistics. Um, geography and data, um, 15, 20 years ago if we went to a government department, if they had an administrative scheme, they may have put some of the data into the computer. So you'd see the form and there'd be lots of data and then when you ask them, they've only put about 20, 30 percent what they really needed into the computer. So it wasn't very accessible. Whereas now, they've the whole questionnaire in the data. So there's a, a much greater potential in administrative data. And the weakness at the moment would be geography. But bringing in the air code creates a potential there for putting geography and integrating different data sources through that geography. So we're kind of at a good time in terms of a richness of data. Um, looking at the data sources, we have the Statistics Act. So when we contact a government department or an agency to look for data, we have to do it through a legal procedure, and the basis would be the Statistics Act. And that would entitle us to access confidential data for statistical purposes. The data need to measure the pressures as well as the actual you know, services being provided by nature. They're going to be influenced by are there big factories or lots of um, quarries or you know particular types of farming you know so what are the pressures on those agricultural and nature areas that are influencing the, the output from them 
In terms of um, getting access to data, um, at the moment we're trying to get access to the ESB meter data, but it takes a few years between going through all the assuring them that we have a sound legal basis for them to give us the data, and then the amount of data, there's going to be millions of records if you have a meter reading every month for maybe two, three million meters and we want it for maybe four or five years, you know, you're going to be in 20, 30, 40 million records. That can be difficult for them to extract and keep their ordinary business going at the same time, the IT system. So we need to plan ahead, and generally it can take up to a year before we get data that we've requested. And then we have the queries after we look at it, you know, because there won't be, um, we might need to go back and get a new data file. So it takes a long time. The next few slides will go through different examples of microdata. Um, the area is so broad that generally there will be a use for almost any type of data source that has any relevance to environment. So we've already obtained some of them, but many of them we haven't yet began to look for access to. Our general approach would be, if we have a microdata file, we try to publish it as a release to make it more available to people. So the, from Irish Water, we got domestic water meter data and published it, and we're due to get another year data from them shortly. Um, gas meter data we published um, for both domestic and non-domestic. And you can see, I think the residential gas meter is only about 7 or 8 percent of total consumption. And um, both of those would be very urban. When you go out into the countryside, you don't have the pipe network for water, and you don't have the pipe network for gas. Whereas for electricity, it will, be, it will cover the whole country, Donegal and Mayo, places that don't have network gas. Um, the building energy ratings, we get that and publish it quarterly. There are about, about half of the dwellings in Ireland would have had a building energy rating. And the file would tell us what type of main central heating fuel they have, electricity, natural gas, um, what type of dwelling it is, whether it's a mid-floor apartment or a detached house, the period of construction, so the age of it. Um, the location will at least be down to county or Dublin Postal District. Um, if we connect that data with our census of population, then we know how many people are living it, in that. And then if we have data from gas and from ESP, we know the actual consumption rather than a modelled. So we can begin to look at fuel poverty or kind of tr changes in consumption from solid fuel to electricity or gas. So there's a lot of potential when you bring together more than one data set together. Um, some of the odometer readings and the road traffic counter, um, in terms of ecosystem, if you want a small area or a habitat, you're going to need geography and local data. So we're hoping over time to combine, say, the vehicle file and the vehicle owner file. So we know someone living in a particular village owns this vehicle. If we combine it with the activity of that vehicle, how many kilometers they've traveled, then what type of engine and fuel they're using, we can begin to build up a local picture of consumption of fuels. And that can help them as a pressure onto the ecosystem. Some other examples here would be for the, some of the survey work we do, the waste generation survey or a business energy use survey. We're making use of administrative data already to process and publish those. So that will mean that we can have a smaller survey sample and then get coverage in areas like services where it can be very hard to get full coverage. The ideal would be to break it down by nice division which means you need a lot of data. 
So if we can get administrative data, that makes that possible. These kind of data sets are more kind of natural kind of agricultural type data. Um, at the end of it there are small comments whether we've requested the data or whether we already have it. Um, on the land parcel information, that would feed into land cover and land use. And the idea there would be to from the Department of Agriculture to look at the, the crop in a field over a time period, maybe 10, 15 years, and see whether the crop is changing from is it permanent grassland or is it rotating between short term grassland and crops, cereal crops. And that will have an impact then on the soil quality and uh, on biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, the septic tank register um, is relatively new, but that will give us kind of an idea, for, for example, of new dwellings that are built in the countryside. So one-off dwellings. So it gives us an, area, an idea of whether we're building in a small kind of footprint in the village or in a town, or whether people are building their own kind of detached house in the field where nobody lived before. And it also then has an element of wastewater and water quality impact. There are lots of them. <laughs> so, um, an area we hope to get into more would be around that agri environment area. So, between kind of gross nutrient budget and use of fertilizer and pesticide. There's a lot of gauge data, like river and tidal gauges and marine gauges. Uh, phenology um, that we could link up with climate data around temperature and sunshine hours and rainfall to see whether there is actually climate change and um, the nature of it. Um, we're hoping at some stage to use um, to do some work around extreme weather events and flooding. So to identify a flooding event and then try to cost what the damage was. Um, I was at one meeting where um, somebody from a, there's a national body around flooding and they said it's impossible to get insurance. So if your house or business is flooded, then you, you, the whole value of the property is gone if you cannot obtain future insurance and you probably, it's probably not possible to sell it even. This is a project we started in March. Um, I was reading a report on climate indicators. Um, it was an EPA funded report. And there were a lot of references into it to a, a lack of data being in the computer. So while the data existed, it was in a library and nobody could access it. So we contacted Met Aaron and agreed to work with them on a project where we would key up some old historical data. Um, we'd seen an example where Minute University had um, done a data rescue project on rainfall. And in what they put in a poster, there were 365 figures per year, one, the amount of rainfall each day for the year. So we thought, well, that, that's not going to be a lot of work. So when we met Met Aaron, they, they had a different project, um, which is a lot more work. So we have about kind of um, 40 to 50 different variables. You've got the humidity, the barometric pressure, you have temperature at different points of the day in different conditions, you have rainfall, cloud formation, and general weather remarks. Um, so we end up with 40 or 50 different variables and it's a mixture of numeric and character data and some of the character data is in the form of symbols. 
for the gale or for frost or snow. So it takes about four hours to get that into the computer and then maybe two hours to check it. And that Aaron kind of want, um, in previous projects, the international standard would be to get two different people to computerize it and then you compare the two different files. No, we don't want to do that because it's a lot more work. So then we have to devise quality checks to, because they want a completely clean data set without errors. So we've got a lot of checking here, kind of, you have the lowest minimum temperature or the, the visibility summary or different types of um, rainfall or whatever. So we can check that back up against the data up there. And we think it's kind of sound enough that we can we can stand over the quality. At the moment, we've given MetAir in one year for 1959. So we're waiting for them to come back with a, their opinion on the quality of what we're doing. How, how many years are you planning to do? That's, that's, well, one, that, that's one month. Exactly. Well, when we met them, we were optimistic. And then when we saw that, we kind of, they gave us five <laughs> years. So we said, OK, we'll try and get five years done. And then we began to realize we could do it. So at the moment, we're doing Phoenix Park. We're hoping to go back to 1880. Oh, so that's just for one place. That's for one month. Oh, but one month in one place. Yeah. Right. So we'd be hoping. Have you thought about maybe using technology to help you? Um, the general impression is kind of the. Yeah, we can key it in four hours, that's scanning it and then cleaning it. Mm -hmm. uh, because in some of the. Yeah, you know, some of the columns. They've written in two pieces of information. So the, you know, for example, if they have to put in the wind direction, northwest, south, southeast, they've also on top of it put in the compass bearing. Or they may have kind of put in the rainfall in millimeters and inches. So in the census of population, we have a form and it's designed beforehand for scanning. But this form was never designed so that the data will be in different locations with different kind of... It'd be very hard for the computer to pick it out, so... I, but I, I wonder about that. I wonder if it might be good for you to look into how technology has progressed to cater for these kind of almost chaotic ways of reporting back in time. Yeah. I just think it might be worth looking into it. There are a couple of people... Um, what we did is in-house, in within an environment, we kind of... We formed up a presentation and then we, people in the office who were interested came along and we looked for volunteers, people to type up one month. And a couple of people, come, some of the new statisticians, you know, want us to scan it. So two or three of them said they'll have a look at it, testing it. But met Aaron advice is that it, internationally it hasn't really worked out. And we asked a few people who had experience and they think it will be difficult. But if we save us time, yeah. But it would be a parallel yeah, kind of project. Parking with Google, straight up. Massive, brilliant project for them, advertising and stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, it's kind of every month and every station and the handwriting. Um, there's a lot of shorthand here. Kind of, <laughs> like for bright day, it might be BT. And then there's symbolic things coming in for kind of, you know, for Gale, it might be a backwards F or whatever. Of course, yeah. So whether it'll actually be recognised. So at the moment we're doing it by hand, but a couple of people are looking at whether you could do it by scanning. Yeah. It's sort of machine learning, artificial intelligence angles in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, here's an example then of kind of some of that data in an Excel sheet. Um, this is all numeric, so it's kind of quite straightforward. Within the data, sometimes, say the number of sunshine hours, if it was kind of 12 and a half hours, they might write down 12.5 or 125 without the decimal. So there's a lot of variation within the data all the time. So, so we, we have a lot of data checking afterwards to look for, you know, how could it be, you know, 120 degrees in Ireland. <laughs> so we're looking for bad data and then checking it again. So beginning to summarise, we're definitely a little bit shy 
you know, compared with the UK or Netherlands. We haven't jumped into trying to do ecosystem accounts, but you know, Stephen and UCD in a few areas have. Um, we kind of initially, when we were established, we had to meet the regulation, the six modules. So a lot of work was on that, and now we're beginning to focus on what microdata might be out there we can make more use of. We need to put the geography in. Um, the general data protection regulation, it's kind of important for everybody that data are well protected, but it makes it harder to do your business because there's a lot more procedures we have to go through. Even internally, if one area has a data file, we have to justify why we want access to it and what variables we need or don't need access to. And that takes a few months. So even internally, we don't just ring up and get the data. There are procedures. Um, in the, you know, when Carl kind of didn't kind of say you got to put valuation on it, that's the most important thing. I was glad he didn't say that. <laughs> so we kind of, we probably will move on the biophysical element. Um, and that kind of, you know, academics, university, research people help us to develop the, the valuation part. Um, and ultimately ecosystems will require a kind of teamwork. We won't be, you know, there's too much in it and too much uncertainty. Um, so I think it will be a while before there's any kind of broad kind of overall account. So we, it'll be sub small accounts that will kind of gradually build up a picture. You know, an example was um, we published a, for fish, uh, for sea fish landings, we published a report on that. Um, if we get the land cover and land use analysis, um, something on forestry. So gradually we kind of get more data available. Okay, so thanks very much. And thanks, Hannah, for organising everything. On the Irish Water one, if we do that first, we, um, there's an idea there of a district meter, so they'd have a, an area and they know the amount, total amount of water supply into that area, and then at the far end is kind of waste coming out. So that would give you, um, you know, so many cubic metres went into it, how many dwellings, how many businesses, and you can begin to build up a picture and estimate. The losses are, generally they're taught to be around 55% of of public treated water, around 55% never gets through a tap. It kind of leaks out somewhere along the way. But you could refine that with district meter data, and we particularly in countryside. Out of yeah. Land, that's hard to get. yeah. Getting anything from Irish water is hard to get. <laughs> so we're hoping to get non domestic as well, and hopefully this year we'll get it, and then we have to try and link it to the to business register to NACE coded. Um, and the ecosystems. Um, 
congratulations on the marine ecosystem report. I thought it was very good, you know, that was published by Samro. Um, um, one just on that, I wouldn't call it an account of it, it's just the yeah, different yeah. values. How would my values, because you can't aggregate what they're using in Yeah. <laughs> but it's a big breakthrough and it's a lot of data and you know it gave us a lot of ideas. You know? um, the approach we had with the fish landing, um, we had what was caught by an Irish boat and landed in Ireland or abroad and what was caught by a foreign vessel and landed in Ireland. You were looking maybe a bit more the region and what was caught there so it could be a Spanish boat and it brought it back to Spain and we didn't include that at all. The data we were getting was from the Sea Fishery Protection Authority and they didn't have that kind of data. In terms of the ecosystem accounts, like in the normal central framework, um, yours that always at the end of the meeting talk about the residence principle. So that kind of, if a tourist comes to Ireland and drives around the car, we should exclude those emissions because they should go to France or the UK. And if an Irish person goes abroad, their emissions should be counted against Ireland. So in terms of kind of the marine, you know, Spanish boat, Russian boat, you know, when you adjust the territorial principle, um, I'm not sure what happens. You know? Yeah, and it, but it's then, it's sort of the complementarity between the central framework and the ecosystem one is that, yeah, what you're collecting is correct from a, system of national accounts point of view, um, in terms of attributing to countries the ac economic activity. But when it does come to the ecosystem sort of question, then that's one where, yeah, the, the information set has to change a little bit to tell the story. And I think that's the type of thing that we want to try and, uh, we need to try and explain uh, in the, um, it doesn't so much, uh, the effect is not so significant on the sort of terrestrial thing, uh, terrestrial side of things, because you can't just sort of, take a tree from Ireland, you know, just come in and take a tree. Uh, but the fish one is, is sort of a different one. And, and a particular issue that's been picked up in the revision process over the next couple of years is marine marine accounts. Um, so I'll have to let the people involved know that. There's, and it's coming, actually the good thing is it's coming from both a, a government point of view, the, the interest in marine accounts, particularly for the small island developing states in the Pacific are particularly interested. Um, but there's also a bit of work going on with, in the corporate space about developing a natural capital protocol for the oceans um, so to see how businesses would think about that. So there's two, yeah, hopefully we can give some better advice on that. Um, there's a number of case studies on sort of coastal types of things. Um, so I think there was some work from the World Bank on looking at mangroves and, and the role of those types of things. I'll have to, I think, thinking to the other question, try, I'm trying to remember which dip bits are around. But I'll, yeah, I'll try and, I'm trying to think of where the... the waves uh, probably take some work on the marine side. Yeah. And it's the... Do you know it? No. There's a, there is, it's a World Bank uh, yeah, Waves yeah. website, which has a lot of case studies and on their knowledge centre. And the UN Statistics Division also has some things there. What, uh, I guess one thing to point out, and why I have trouble answering the question in a way, is that in the context, there's a lot of work that's been done in this space which is not necessarily been done over the last three or four years, or five or six years, in the context of the SEA and the ecosystem mechanic framework itself. But it's very easy to see how that work can be linked to ecosystem accounting if you wanted to retrofit it in a way. So it's only in, more re in the last couple of years that we've actually got ecosystem accounting projects which are being starting from why we want to try and test this framework and see how it works but this idea that things might be retrofitted is, is also there so it's sort of the case study suite is potentially broader than, than that. Uh, uh, Luke is, is a PhD student in year one but hopefully one of his tasks is to look at this and try and develop a marine ecosystem account for Ireland and see how far we can bring that. He's also with the, the, on the asset side of genuine savings. So the, the UK have done, yeah, right. done stuff. The Inclusive Wealth Index? No, the World Bank uh, Changing Wealth of Nations have just introduced fisheries as a measure of, of, of wealth. 
uh, I don't know the method. Uh, but then there's another piece of work by a guy called Eli Fenichel. I don't know whether you've come across that. But he's done a valuation of fish stocks in the Baltic. Uh, and his approach is quite, it's a bit unique. But it's really quite cool, I think. It's incredibly technical. Just a word of warning. <laughs> Eli Fenichel, uh, F-E-N-I-C-H-E-L, from Yale. And uh, geography, ideally we, we'd have an air code on the data, but say with the meter data, the gas meter data, we looked at the address and took out the county or Dublin Post district. So at least then we've got it into a small area. So it's a mixture, but ideally uh, um, the air code. Yeah. I think the satellite imagery is getting better and better and more frequent. Um, but if you have um, actual microdata, you know, from the Department of Agriculture, what's in the field, or from the Forest Service, the boundary of the forest, then I think if you combine the two, you know, that you need to, because you'll end up with better quality. I spoke briefly with Carl if you know, before the meeting on that. Yeah, I think that it's certainly a very active area of work. Uh, in terms of how do we use earth observation information. There's actually a group that's been formed within the GEO project, uh, Global Earth Observation Network, uh, called Ecosystem, oh no, Earth Observation for Ecosystem Accounting. So they're trying to look specifically and work with NASA, ESA, um, Google Earth and others to try and see what techniques can be used to suit an accounting setting to get outputs that are relevant there. But I think it will, for those who have been involved in the space, it seems to be that when you, if you use only remote sensing, um, you'll be able to tell a story, which may be useful for some situations, but it may not get you to the situation that the level of accuracy you need for certain types of decisions uh, at that sort of scale. So how you combine it with microdata uh, and or, you know, administrative information, 
is going to be key. And by way of example, the example in the Netherlands where they've done the ecosystem accounting, their first output was a land account for the Netherlands. Uh, in various places, I think they went down to one or two metres. So they were picking up roadside verges as being a particular type of feature that they needed to think about separately. Um, so, yeah, so it's something about the level of information they had. But in order to create that, they used, I think, nine different data layers. So remote sensing and a whole lot of administrative stuff overlaid them all and created a... Um, I think they ended up with 140 different ecosystem types to map out the Netherlands um, that they could then use. So, but that's, that took them a year. Okay, that's, that's an easy quick time Yeah, for two, for two time points. So I've got 2010, 2015 to do that. Um, and I think it's, it, it, obviously, and if they did it again, they have it, they've got the methodology in place now, and then you can keep on bringing more stuff together, so. So the only context, is that Charles has done various different uh, projects in terms of not We joined the uh, Ordnance Survey had been given responsibility for land cover and land use. So we joined a group there about a month or two ago and went to a, a first meeting. Um, there's an element of kind of EPA and those have been doing it every five or six years on crane data. But if you want to do it annually and you want to maybe make an estimate of built up area within a particular small locality, then I think you're going to have to supplement the satellite imagery with anything else you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We do, but it is into the future. You know, I think the first thing we do would be analyse the agricultural land parcel data, you know, and make that more because there's a lot of data there looking at what crop is in each field. So there, there'll be millions and millions of records, and we can look at a time series and kind of bring it down to a small release and make it more available to people. Um, I think that's the hard thing here that we. Companies that here yet that open data. You have your own problems to see us all get up to date. But there's researchers here, like, we meant to have access to the five new for academic boxes. But when you go to look at it, they only give you five meat kilometers squared, which is ridiculous to be any kind of major research instead of. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm just saying, like, in terms of working on there's a lot of work beyond the open up data. There is work beyond in the department of expenditure. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah. I mean, I know from your own, what you were saying here in terms of getting data, but it is, you know I mean, there's agreements in place, but they're not being, they're not being, they're not being done in the spirit of what the agreement is about, you know what I mean, like, that's important to say, in terms yeah. of, and in terms of EPA, which have done a lot of work, I think, in making data available, but the same thing, when you go to AER, it's just scanned, you know what I mean, that data is available to them in terms of, you know what I mean, data sets, but it should be machine readable at this stage, like, or even that was a seven five that was submitted by the original person. So there is there's a big thing in this in terms of if you want to go forward, you mean um, in terms of open more open data, you mean the OSI, you mean they just haven't got the concept of what you mean data is needed by researchers compared to what the traditional kind of use of that data was. I mean I think that's important to say. Yeah. Like the, the Netherlands kind of work, you know, what Carl was saying, the scale, you know, one in 10,000 or even more granular, one in 5,000. So they can distinguish, you know, a hedgerow from a small water feature and whatever. Um, and, you, you know, 
you cannot you could do a little research project in a small village, but to get national data, you're gonna you're gonna need people to get share it. GDPR is kind of coming more and more in on top of can people legally share data? Um, and that's then the one of the big issues with the likeness data. Yeah. Um, well, even to get the, the private view data is like a decent database that you can start building a habitat map on it and yeah. the, the, for copyright reasons and the OSI is not to copyright. That's the reality. And it's not going to, like, you know I mean, we're still working generally with boring data. If we've talked about 25 hectare, you know what I mean? Now, mm -hmm. it matches up. I've done work recently where I've matched the, and it is a good project, it's the National Park Wildlife Service Habitat Master Register. You mean, I match that to, uh, compare that at catchment level to the core data, and it does match up quite well. You mean, because the, the agricultural core in his base and like this, and I'm only looking at agriculture, I can't speak to the rest of them. But I do know if you look at the turn up data, even in the, the National Parks and Wildlife you mean, it's it's very secular or which makes me worry. You mean, it's a bit like NACE and the EGs yeah. and the CSO again. Well, I'm just saying that like, openness, I mean, this is a lot of talk about it, but yeah. practicality is on the ground in terms of getting it. You mean, like, you know, like if I want to get it, or if the Eastern Division and Region wants to get it, you mean, there's two different processes in order to go through the union. Yeah, certainly we need to kind of, and like the CSO doesn't have any policy roles, so we, you know, we can't advocate so much here, but there is a need for the policy department to kind of identify the barriers. And the worst scenario is where the researcher has a year and they spent eight months trying to get ready. So you, are you back? <laughs> so you need to have the data available quickly, so you can spend your time at the more quality, quality level. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a, a really important point. I think it's something that we should highlight: that this balance between open source and data protection. Um, and you know, we need some clarity on on that issue. Yeah. So, you know, just uh, on data protection, if you go to Estonia, pretty much all of your data is on, but you know, but and they have data policy in which if you are happy for one, for the government to take your agency, so the tax people, then you should be pretty much happy for another government agency. And they have an amazing internal system of uh, checks and balances. And then you don't say no for all the data, but you just go yes, no question, have they treated this, have they, is their salary of this man? Yes, therefore you tax you, uh, tax funds are required. So, and similarly, those sort of data uh, agreements should, in theory, be possible between government departments to say that if you are happy to hand this over to go to the government, then it should be accessible to other parts of government for the purposes to, to build these data products so we can better understand them. Perhaps a key point, I think, from a natural capital accounting point of view uh, and trying to inform this debate about natural capital is uh, that every country in the world has its own issues around data access and um, things and things are not necessarily getting easier or you know, technologically it's not the issue, it's sort of the access type of things. Um, we're trying to put a message through around the sea that certainly there are data challenges but there, there's not enough there to, you don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And at the moment, if we, if we don't have a sort of natural capital on the agenda because uh, people are, you sort of got to find this balance between what you can, what stories you can tell with the data that's available, even if it's not perfect, uh, and then imagine improving that over time. Because the likelihood will be that for the next, you know, any number of decades, we'll be arguing about data and methods. Uh, our biggest challenge at the moment is actually getting it on the page to start with. And, it, and our challenge is to find the right level of quality which means that it can answer some questions well, perhaps not all of them, but at least it's accepted as being strong enough and robust enough that it stays there, as opposed to perhaps a lot of stuff which will be done over time where someone puts out a big number or a, a tough thing about natural capital and then people dismiss it quite, you know, ah, you know they've just made it up or, or it's too small so it doesn't really matter uh, type of thing. So we're trying to reach some sort of level of quality which gets a level of acceptance that this should be part of the landscape and then work Increasingly on the data and methods and, and improvements. I'm going to just come in there. Just I'm from the EPA, um, just to let you all know, we have a half million big research project that we call for at the moment to do that from the agenda and don't let the part of the agency be doing somewhere else. So, what we really
you like it's a first pass, it's some international accounts, but even the data that is available. So essentially you can go to the policy maker and go, this is why this is useful. And then perhaps looking at one or two cashments around the country to say, what are we missing at the national scale and can we pay this more than what data we need to do? So that's all on the UK website at the moment. And it's passing it for the four years of this market. Cool. Good idea response to the urban planning one. Um, the two, two thoughts come to mind. One, one is that what we've found in this natural capital space is there's any number of sectors that could be potentially interested in it because it's sort of a change in the way you think about it. So, so where we've ended up mostly engaging is more probably on the environmental side. Um, where we'd like to go, which is the intention of the CEA, is to link with the macroeconomic and finance sector and say, you're the guys that you're making economic policy, but you're not taking into account environmental data as much as you should. This is a means by which you can, we've organised environmental information in a way that might suit your, um, should fit into assessment of productivity and industry sector policy and those sorts of things. Um, it is sort of fairly obvious that when we're into this sort of planning space or spatial accounting sort of space that it should link on a planning side. It's not a discussion that we've had a lot of, from a, I'm just talking from a SEA point of view. Um, I think in part because uh, most, I get the impression that most uh, planning people are thinking spatially anyway, unlike most macroeconomists. Um, so in a sense they sort of figure they've got the information set to allow them to be able to do that anyway. Um, and it's also that C has come across I think more as a national level effort than it might be as something that's applicable at local government type of area. Um, but we are increasingly, I think all of us who are involved in this space are increasingly running into people from that local government space and then thinking about how can I think about green space and the role of that and whatever. So two examples of particular relevance. One is in Oslo where they've got a, an ecosystem accounting project where they're applying the SEA in looking at how they can use ecosystem accounting to improve the management of Oslo. And it's a pretty green place anyway. But nonetheless they're looking at that and they're looking at the different services that green space provides and then looking at trade-offs and trying to use that sort of thing. And they're looking at lots of questions around valuation in actual fact. Um, there's been an increasing amount of work in the UK uh, on looking at ecosystem services at urban level. And I don't know whether it's been published, but I think they had some uh, work on looking at urban accounts for Manchester and developing those. So, and then they've recently done some work on air filtration services of green space within London, I think, with a couple of boroughs in London to see whether they could value those ecosystem services at that scale of detail. So I think the idea that it could be applied is certainly there, but it's not one where there's been a, to my knowledge, a really active possibility. So, which is why it's great to get these sort of types of forums together to try and say, oh, someone might have an idea. We've tried to engage with the Melbourne City Council where I, where I live, and it's sort of, yeah, it hasn't sort of, apart from a couple of nice conversations, it hasn't really gone anywhere. But some, some work we've been involved uh, with was commissioning some work for the Department of Environment up north, the Department of Agriculture and Environment, um, and it was to undertake a number of urban sites, green spaces essentially, undertaking natural capital accounting for those green spaces, mm -hmm. and looking at various services that are provided in the valuation of those, which is good for justifying investment in those green spaces and protecting those green spaces. But we're thinking now about how do we take it to the next level in terms of trying to influence planning decisions beyond simply maybe green spaces. Um, I'm looking for that can be incorporated into the urban planning context. I, just, um, I mean, as an aside, well, sort of aside, linking back to the national planning framework, one thing I did notice, there's some really, when you look at the urban amenities heritage sections, sections sort of 7, 8 and 9, those, those outcomes, there's quite a, there's a couple of figures and sort of depictions in there about this notion of people and place and location, and this sort of nice systemic view of the world. Um, but interestingly, in the, in the, there's an earlier section of the, uh, an investment model for Ireland, uh, which I think came from a 2005 report from memory, so it's a little while ago. But it had a sort of things you should take into account in thinking of investment and infrastructure in particular. Uh, and it had social, economic, environmental dimensions. But when you looked at the environmental dimension of it, it was all about um, essentially uh, sewerage, water supply, uh, electricity, and energy and waste. There was nothing about the idea of that you might actually invest in natural capital to provide some of the services which at the moment you might be paying for some hard infrastructure to build. 
So I think that's part of the challenge is how do you find these alternative infrastructure solutions? It's still infrastructure, it's just you're investing in natural capital as opposed to built capital to perform the same function. So that, I think that's part of the change of mindset that this would be nice to see. Because the UK natural capital committee is very keen on the idea of advancing that gear and new developments. Right. Again, sort of not quite offsetting, but something that I suppose is causing a bit of controversy in terms of, yeah. you know, most of the hardcore ecologists and biodiversity. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, just follow up on that. Jesus, Sorry, yeah, just follow up on that briefly on the comment there. I think we all of us here, or at least most of us here, had said we're here because we're really committed to natural capital. The natural capital country has been crucial for the future for the environment and natural planning. But it seems to me it's challenging in the sense that the community, because of so many services that natural capital provides in different areas, different disciplines, it seems to be a challenge to get, to get everything working together. But how would just define families, families and commons? No, uh, yeah, no, it's true, it's not very easy. Um, certainly all of the examples of, of ecosystem accounting that I've seen have involved multiple players uh, involved. So whether it's worked through the World Bank in different developing countries, in the Philippines and others, uh, work not necessarily the whole country, but uh, different places within Australia and Victoria, uh, subsections of Victoria. Uh, there's been some accounts done for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, that all of them, the UK, and the Netherlands, that they've all, so there are a number of examples of where teams of people have been brought together, and what we're generally seeing is that the, the SEA ecosystem accounting framework is providing a, a platform for all of these different people to come and have a reason for, for being. Where I think we're, probably two things where it's a bit weaker, which uh, speaks to the challenge. One is that, and it may have come across in my answers here, that there's a sense that perhaps ecosystem accounting as a framework can suit lots of different situations, marine, urban, agricultural landscapes, lots of things, uh, national, large scale, small scale. Uh, so I think one of our challenges in the SEA has been that we've sort of uh, partly selling it as a tool that can suit everybody, uh, which then tends to dilute the, the message about what it can do. So I think we've got a challenge in the, in the short term to be a bit more specific about a primary purpose, and then think that these are the other things that might hang off it, but you know, and therefore the set of data, which I think would then drive right. These are the stakeholders we particularly need to be involved, and it will be a broad set. The other bit, which is the other sort of part of the equation, is that we're still working on this question of encouraging people who are making the actual decision. So that's one thing is on the supply side and creating the accounts, getting some integration on the demand side and the user side that this is the set of information they'd like is another one which is a continuing and ongoing challenge. So there's been movement in that space in the sense that at least uh, as a statistical and accounting community we're more aware of engaging with users than we normally are, so that's good. Uh, there have been a couple of forums that have been organised on policy linkages uh, to try and um, explain the ways and give examples of uh, how ecosystem accounting and the SEA generally have been used. So the World Bank has run a couple of what they call policy forums um, where they've published different case studies and different results. So I think we're still, in that sense, we're still working through that challenge of thing. The biggest thing we find, that, uh, so but maybe a particular piece of evidence, after four or five years of the WAVES program, the World Bank program on ecosystem and environmental accounting, they did a study of uptake and how it went because they had used a very institutional structure. They said they went in through the central bank and finance ministry, get, got the environment departments and the technical agencies and set up these overarching committees. So this is all excellent. Uh, and then they were assessing how they went in terms of delivering on producing accounts. And one of the key findings out of that was that the bigger, biggest blockages are generally sitting in middle management uh, of technical and policy agencies. That it's, you can have a really good discussion at the top level and get them sold on the idea that this is a great idea. Generally, it's possible to convince the technical people, uh, the lower levels, that it's 
yeah, yeah, that's something I work on. I'm fascinated by the fact that I could do, you know, 100 years of turning data into something else that might be useful. But finding people at a middle management level to really buy into it um, was the biggest barrier. And that seems to be true both on a technical side and on a policy side. And I think there may be something in trying to work out our strategies of how we get people at that level to, um, to, to work together more effectively. Uh, so it's, it's not a brilliant answer, but somehow working together is the hardest thing. <laughs> I don't want to cut off the discussion, um, I'm just aware of the time, so um, we, there's some sandwiches and stuff downstairs um, and, and we'd like to continue, you know, if, if people want to stay around and continue discussions, that, that would be great. Uh, but I think I'm just going to draw this to a place. Do you want to say one quick thing, Dan? Just one thing that's a worry about in terms of this approach is that do we go from an ecosystem to equal units or equal council in that we break down every area into some type of you're talking about 150 units, so you mean like, but do we do with the connection between different ecosystems and between, like, let's say for use of sizes, and you start to look at each of the individual uh, class, or class types, do you do the connection between them, do you think, or how do you stop that? Well, so a very live discussion at the moment is on the concept of eco intermediate services, mm -hmm. uh, which essentially reflect the dependencies between ecosystems. Uh, and there are, there's yeah, different schools of thought about whether or not we should look at that, but I think it's fundamental that we, the more I've thought about it, if we don't capture those dependencies, we're going to think that some ecosystems are more important than others, when in actual fact we're missing the fact that the, you know, the forests at the top end of the catchment are actually equally as important as anything wetlands at the bottom. Uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, that stuff has to come through. There is a risk, um, but I think that's the reason that you want to take a national approach in a sense. Because if you then, if, if your approach was only to focus on particular ecosystems or particular types of ecosystems, like well, we'll focus on wetlands or focus on forests, you're missing the potential role. So that and that's where the spatial layout becomes important. And yeah, so that, that the idea and that's sort of the national account thing. If you if, it wouldn't be to focus on a particular e one ecosystem asset. It would be to say we'll look at a catchment and we'll look at all of the different ecosystems in there. It may, it may sort of look at each one individually, but at least it should present it in a way which encourages people to think that these things might be connected. Um, so, yeah. Surely the industry ecosystems take input from industry ecosystems, and that's part of your text, remarkable flows, right? Okay. Yes, that's the way that, and, but there was an initial, in, in a lot of the discussion around ecosystem services, it's a focus on what are called final ecosystem services, which is at, at the point there's an interaction between the ecosystem and people. And often that may be at the end of a chain. You know, in fisheries, it would ignore the, the nurseries that are sitting in some kelp fields out somewhere else. And then you, if you don't make the logical connection that if you destroy the kelp, you don't end up with the fish out somewhere else, which is obvious if you think about it, but if you only focus on the final bit where you catch the fish, then you've missed the story. And I, um, so it's just that the ecosystem services discussion has tended to focus on the final which when you start thinking about the locational spatial aspects is, is clearly insufficient, but um, it's, been a, it's still an ongoing discussion to try and make sure that the accounting uh, goes broadly. The, the concern becomes, sorry, the concern becomes, wow, there must be so many of these connections, we can't possibly get them all, uh, how can we possibly succeed? So there's this sort of balancing of the, the reality, but the, the necessity type of thing. Thank you very much, Carly. Just help me. I, well, okay. oh, Just sorry. on the coordination for the EPA research grant. You, if if you know, typically a project might have a project board. Yeah. So, like if if the Irish Forum was part of the project board, if that was possible, just to, you know, to try and get that coordination. Yeah, we work on that. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to thank uh, Carl and Jerry very much for speaking this morning. Hannah for organising everything, and please come downstairs have some tea and coffee and sandwiches, so thank you guys.